Hey everyone, happy new year. The realignment is back in action. We're excited to be here. We noticed a bunch of people over break who were catching up on episodes, loved our episode of Mark where we really got into it. So in honor of that, we decided to have an episode which led to a lot of disagreement, something we're going to do more going into the new year. The book is The Next Civil War Dispatches from the American Future by Canadian journalist Stephen Marsh. Sagar, I know you disagreed with this one. What was this conversation about? Yeah, it was just a tough one for me personally. Stephen is convinced wholeheartedly based on what he calls experts and models uh, that America is destined for another civil war. There's no way out of it. The institutions are rotting. The episode is really us challenging him saying, what is actually different from so many different periods of civil strife today? His answer seems to be that it's simply inevitable. It is just different this time. People just feel uh, you know, angry and upset, and they don't have any pathways out. It's not a secret, and I challenge him quite heavily whenever during this episode. I just don't believe that the case to be whatsoever. I don't think that we're living a particularly unique um, strife time. The whole point about history is that it does rhyme, um, and civil wars are very rare for a reason. I don't know. What do you think, Marshall? Yeah, all that said, I think the conversation got particularly useful after we just moved off the frame around, like, is there a civil war or not? We're more focused on, hey, like, what actually keeps countries together? Because, like he said, he's Canadian. Quebec tried to leave. Scotland mm-hmm. tried to leave the United Kingdom. The Catalans are trying to leave Spain. So in the 21st century, there are all these debates around how many countries should exist. He pointed out that since 1945, the number of countries has dramatically increased. So whether or not you buy the whole civil war frame, it's actually useful to ask yourself, actually, why would the America say centralized in a decentralized era? So a lot of interesting questions. I think the top line thing to say here is this is a conversation that we take not lightly. We don't take this conversation lightly. And also, this is in the zeitgeist. Everyone's talking about it. And to a certain degree, we want this to be a show that engages with the ideas that are on everyone's mind, especially today, January 6th, whether or not we agree with them or not. Okay, quick notes, because it is the start of the year. Sagar and I were talking. We're going to condense and continue to condense our intros out. This will be the probably most hit you over the head version. We, thanks to our friends at Swapstack, are experimenting with their new tip function. So if you want to throw a tip to the show, you can go in the show notes there. If you like this episode, if you didn't like this episode, send us a note, send us a tip. We'd always appreciate it. Two. Substack goes out today. Our um, intern slash producer, Aaron, who a lot of you guys like the Substack, is going to start writing. And he actually wrote a great summary of the book and of the episode. And he asked we could put that in the newsletter. So we're going to start putting Aaron's writing in the newsletter itself, give you all more content. Y'all really love it when the content there is original. So lots of great stuff there. Finally, Bookshop. Stephen has a book. There are a lot of great books we really enjoy. Go to our link at bookshop.org. And last but not least, keep saying finally, but here's the actual finally. Huge thank you to Lincoln Network for supporting our work. Here's the episode. Happy New Year. We're really excited to be back for everyone. Stephen Marsh, welcome to The Realignment. Pleasure to be here. Let's start with the obvious question as people who are a little skeptical of civil war discourse, obviously. Why is a question of a coming American civil war a reasonable and even appropriate question to ask in 2022? Well, the United States is a textbook case of a country headed for civil war. I mean, it's, uh, you know, what I'm drawing on in this book is kind of the best available models drawn from political science and from environmental science and from military history and from, you know, many different fields. And the state of the, the, the state of the United States with hyper partisanship, the decline of institutions, along with, uh, you know, unbelievable levels of inequality. Uh, both horizontal inequality and vertical inequality, along with environmental degradation. I mean, these are all what leads countries to civil war. And I think, uh, you know, civil wars in smaller countries are catastrophes for the for the species. But a civil war in America, of course, will affect everyone and affect everyone in the world, not just not just Americans. And a quick follow up here. Could you just def- because you could provide a useful definition of what a civil war is in the book. So what is a what is actually like the technical definition? I think it's like a thousand combatant thousand deaths, deaths per year. year. And then the and then there's civil strife. So can you explain like what those terms mean then? 
Well, their terms derive from PRIO, so from the uh, Peace Research Research Institute of Oslo, where uh, you know a lot of the experts I talk to work because they deal with. Uh, you know, a- actually, they've been working on, you know, a lot of small country civil wars, and suddenly they find themselves like, oh, my God, we got to deal with America now. Um, but they uh, their definition is 25 combatant deaths a year is the start of civil strife. So that's like low level. And then between and then a thousand deaths is usually the start of civil war. Now, for a country the size of America and as with the geographical size of America um, and, and the population of America, um, obviously, those numbers are only vague. But on the other hand, I, I mean, I, what we're seeing is the rise of political violence to normalcy. And the, and that's really what matters. Uh, the fact that one third of Americans think that violence is appropriate to use against your own government, which a, a recent poll showed. I mean, that's more of a demonstration of where things are headed. So I'm going to be honest, I'm very skeptical. Um, and oh, okay. where I'm coming from this is what is the question that divides America right now on the Constitution, on the that would constitute a civil war. So I'm thinking back to my Civil War history, battle cry of freedom, the industrial North and the slave South. The central question is: Are we a slave nation that dominate that allows slave power to have a constitutional check on industrial power mm-hmm. or not? It's actually super simple. We have the nullification crisis, bleeding Kansas. We have, what, the Compromise of 1850. Every single question yeah. that comes down to it is slave or not slave. Yeah, I don't see that at all um, in American society in the year 2021. So what are we even fighting about? Well, it's not... Um it, it's not going to be a replication of the of the first civil war. Like, it's going to be very different. It's not going to be armed... Of course, you know, of course. But what's the question, right? It was a binary thing for 50 yeah. years. So like now yeah, what's the binary question? Well, the problem is not like it won't be binary. It'll be multiplicities. It'll be like what happened in Iraq, which is like sectarian conflict, you know, tribalism on the of the most uh, minor variety and militias, like minor militias that actually form and reform sort of in shifting orders with each other and then and then create huge amounts of violence. I mean, if you try to keep track of the Syrian civil war, which I tried to do for this book as a model, I mean, it's practically impossible. Like to just even sure. understand who is fighting who at what point. And what 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 the the arrival of a, of, a, of the next civil war is not one political crisis leading to uh, an you know a political disagreement ending in war. Uh, it is chaos ending in mass violence. And that's that, that's what that's what I'm seeing happening. And, you know, the, the differences between that are, you know, there you, there is no divide, uh, according like along those lines. But, you know, it's worth representing that it's worth remembering that hyper partisanship is at such a place now that um, the two sides don't want to marry each other. Uh, they don't want to work together. They don't want to uh, be in the same places as each other. They're sorting. They're separating out from each other physically. And the the, the difference between, uh, you know, say a Midwestern state and a Northeastern state is social as much as it's political. Like, you know, when you look at the chart of where abortion access is, of where how many how many gay marriages, how many people who are in gay marriages do you know? Uh like what it, um, do you own guns? Do you go to church? Those lines are pretty much exactly the Civil War lines, right? And and even with Texas and California, where they came to, they weren't really involved in the Civil War, but they did have uh, separate decisions on the slavery question. Um, those those changes uh, do remain. So you know, in some sense, like what I'm talking about here is very different from the first civil war. But on the other hand, in some ways, the civil war was never settled. It was certainly never settled symbolically. It was never settled, uh, in, in like reconstruction did not happen. And, you know, a, 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 a political, um, a ter- terrorist groups in the South essentially got home rule for themselves in 1877. So, you know, it, it isn't like the first civil war, but in some sense, it's a, it's a more chaotic continuation of it, if that makes sense. 
Sure. I uh, just wanted to follow up on one thing you said, because I think this is important and frankly, very often ignored by a lot of the liberals I find engaging in civil war discourse. A lot of the phenomenon that you described about social ostracization of the other side is actually yeah. almost entirely a phenomenon led by elite liberalism. So no. college educated. No, 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 no. College educated Democrats are the ones who are disproportionately more likely to say that they're not going to be people who will date others on the other side, be much more likely to say that they wouldn't want to live with somebody who shares a different political affiliation. I am not claiming in whatsoever that right wingers are very tolerant or, you know, like the most loving people who are absolutely there. But the actual dynamic polarization um, from what we have seen seems concentrated, particularly in the social strata amongst elite liberals. So you can no. dispute that characterization. Uh, I would just love to see why you think that's not the case. Well, look, I'm a Canadian. I don't have a dog in yeah. this fight. Like I'm not on one side or the other. Like I'm really not. But it is both sides. Like it, like the, the ostracization and the and the um con the 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 hatred for the other side. I mean, by every available metric, it, it comes from both sides. Like Republicans don't want to marry Democrats. Democrats don't want to marry Republicans. I mean, there was a fascinating study that where they used uh, phone. Uh, uh, location apps uh, on Thanksgiving mm. to chart like families where there were liberals and conservatives in the same family and their uh, Thanksgivings ended about an hour and a half sooner than other people's <laughs> Thanksgivings. The, the, the hatred is really building on both sides. I don't like, and I'm not saying that as an either or proposition. I'm just saying that is, that is what's happening. And um, you know, you know, I think it, it, the the it's very easy to stereotype the other side very quickly and you know whenever I, all these shows that i'm doing for this i do a lot of liberal shows i do a lot of conservative shows they all stereotype the other side and I, what i'm noting what all that i'm noting is not who's right or who's wrong but that both that it is happening and that there are consequences from that and th those consequences mm -hmm. are really profoundly serious also yeah, you know like I, just I, on a basic point just on a basic point, like Trump voting Republicans are by far the most pot. The secession is by far the most popular idea among them. I mean, it's also popular among Democrats increasingly, like in California. But Southern Republicans are the most secessionist uh, group, identifiable group in the United States. Yeah. And look, I don't I don't actually dispute that. And I think that directionally we can posit that there is a lot of hatred on both sides here. I, I'm, I'm interested in the the discourse around political violence though, because mm -hmm. something that I wanna highlight for the audience here, and I think is, is coming through in your remarks here is that we can be too hampered in our conception of like, like you said, what the civil war looked like. Civil war doesn't mean yeah. people put on blue and people put on gray in the year 2022, especially in a state Correct. like Texas where there's Austin, like where does Austin fit within that dynamic? I'm from Portland, Oregon, so I kind of get the directional deal of like, yeah. you know, like where does I'm, Portland I'm, fit? Oh, yeah, because Oregon, super, yeah. super, three-fourths of Oregon is incredibly conservative. So this isn't like a rehash of Civil War point. But I guess my question is, if you're looking at civil strife, you're looking at a thousand deaths, can't you argue that 1960s America was in the midst of some type of civil war? If you add the weather underground, if you add the um, violence like Kent State, you could add in the hijackings, you could add in like a lot of the riots, you could add in like if you're a Black Panther um, in California in the 1970s, Symbionese Liberation Front, you actually almost certainly think you are in a war against the U.S. government. So just we're getting to the how is this time different question because it seems like even if we cite different areas of american political history even under the violence metric the 60s and 70s were a hundred times worse oh no not even close i mean for for example like uh you know the the weathermen th their membership according to the fbi who had reason to exaggerate it was probably about a <laughs> thousand people was at its peak. That, that's how many people were part of the weathermen. The Black Panthers are probably the most overrated political force in history. I mean, they were treated as a kind of real radical terrorist organization. I mean, the, the maximum they ever reached was 10,000 people. They, they produced almost no violence of any, except against each other. They, they killed a lot of each other, but they didn't really produce a lot of actual violence in the streets and the, the, the what the their political goal their, their political achievements in the end were a couple of seats on the um uh on the uh, oakland city council 
you know, what we're dealing with now is oath keepers who number in the millions and who have very serious posts, both in the Republican legislatures, but also on school boards and in police departments. You have the sovereign citizens who are about, at minimum, uh, 600,000 people, but that's a, a much lower number than is actually true. Um, and you have large groups of militias that organize in a long way. So that's one thing is the, the violent groups compared to the 60s are much more extensive thing, and much I, larger. I just want to I, I clarify my point. My point, I, I agree if you're, I wasn't really meaning in terms of membership. I just mean if we were to use the standard of a thousand combatant deaths, it seems yeah. much easier to look at the numbers in the 1960s and say, I mean, MLK, RFK, JFK, yeah. you know, uh, um, you know, uh, plenty of, well, um, you know, assassination Muhammad is a different, yeah, assassination is a different metric, right? Because, I mean, the thing about America is that assassination is so ridiculously common there. Like one out of 11 presidents have been assassinated. I mean, just to put that in perspective, like in Britain, one prime minister in history has been assassinated in 1814. Right. And there, like there hasn't been a, there has been one attempt on a Canadian prime minister's life in history. Um, so assassination in America is a very different thing. But the other thing I think you have to remember about the 60s is that civil rights passed Civil Rights Act passed with bipartisanship support of both parties. JFK's assassination and, 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 R, and RFK's and MLK's assassination were treated broadly, certainly by politicians, as, an, as national catastrophes. And um, when you look at something like Watergate, Watergate is a scandal where the, the, the press reported on corruption, the people believed the press, and the politicians responded to the people. That's actually evidence of the system working. Whereas today, what you have, I mean, the most important difference between the 60s and today is that American governmental institutions are in collapse. And they do not have authority. They do not have anywhere near the legitimacy they had in the 60s. And, and the reason for that is just a basic decline in faith in all institutions. And so, you know, what, like what the lead up to civil wars look like in other countries, Chile, uh, you know, various European countries, is slowly transnational institutions lose their legitimacy. I institutions that bring all Americans together lose their legitimacy. That's already happened on a number of fronts in the United States. And so when that happens, then you lose the, the, the belief, the faith in the peaceful transition of power. And when you lose that, you get violence. And when you get violence, everything falls apart. Everything falls apart. I'm, I'm just having trouble reconciling with this. Also, on the Oath Keepers, I just checked, they only claim tens of thousands of members. So I'm not sure where the millions figure is coming from. Well, but they can, in terms they, they, their, their report, like the recent reports of their infiltration, like the, the Oath Keepers list is pretty extensive. I mean, it is, it, it, and, and, Maybe, and in terms of their, saying, like, million it's, seems it's, it's like extensive. a lot of people, um, for, for a pretty, well, it's America, as it's I understand it, fringe right wing, certainly. Um, but what I'm thinking about here is what constitutionally makes this different than 1877 when you have armed KKK, Nathan Bedford Forrest thugs rampaging against blacks in the American South anarchist movements of the 1900s there were more bombs exploded in the streets then than at any previous time uh the 1960s i mean it, it seems that a lot of this is a larp um and i mean that with respect but the reg the overwhelming amount of civil war discourse that i hear is online and on twitter and it doesn't seem there's to 700 reflect All right go ahead there are 700 people in a Washington prison for rioting mm. on the Capitol who consider themselves political prisoners and sing the national anthem every night before they go to bed. Now, you know, from an American point of view, I, like I'm a foreigner looking at another country. If I saw that happening in France, I would say, oh, there's a civil conflict. Like if I if yeah, I saw that happening, in, who are if, if I saw that happening in Venezuela, I would say that's a civil conflict. And when I see well, it in America, yellow vest people in French prisons, like this is what I'm getting at. Like countries have some sort of civil strife. I think that's fine. 700 is actually not that many people. I mean, look, I don't want to downplay January 6. I think it was bad. I mean, ultimately, nobody died or oh, sorry, nobody was killed. Um, the people who died were people who had heart attacks because it was probably like the most. There was a police officer beaten to lives. death. 
There was a police I, officer beating That's, that's not true. But look, we don't have to get into this. But like that, they literally, the autopsy report and said that that wasn't true. Now, once again, what, what I think is very important in order to come down to this is what makes this different? And I think this is the central question. Then 1919. I mean, you know, we, if we or sorry, uh, the 1920s. And then even also, if we look in the 1920s, we think about this when you're talking about government. Government was completely captured by corporate interest, didn't work whatsoever. Calvin Coolidge says the business of government is a business. I mean, these were not necessarily institutions that went ahead and responded to public will. It just like what is different about right now? as opposed to so many different times of strife, bombs in the streets, lack of faith in government. I can think of three off the top of my head just in American history. If we want to go down the European route, we can talk about Russia um, and the czars, a pre lead up to the Bolshevik revolution. We could talk about England. We can talk about You just described the lead up to a revolution. Yeah. That is what I'm talking about. Right. I'm talking about the sure. lead up to revolutions. But like, that's what I'm saying. Why right. is, it it is, why is this Russia like and not America in the 1870s? Well, America in the 1870s was a, a a massively violent place that eventually came to a political solution that involved essentially decentralizing government and giving the South, you know, giving the South the peace while it were, so that the North would have peace. And that was the end of Reconstruction. So, you know, the 1870s were like a sort of aftermath to the Civil War, where, where violence was very con continuous. There has been a lot of violence in American life, obviously. And there's been, always been a lot of violence in American political life. That too is obviously. But the institutions have never been as degraded as they are now. The hatred for both parties has never been even remotely close to what it is now. And and, and also the, the willingness to, to use extra democratic tools to achieve democratic ends has never been what it is now. So... You know, the 60s, like America burned in the 60s, but the institutions were very much alive. And I, I think if you look at the 1920s or the 1930s, even the 1930s, where you have enormous poverty, enormous chaos, there was a huge amount of solidarity, right? Ba basic solidarity between all between Americans. And that's just evaporated. Or, you know, to be really precise about it, I just don't see any evidence of it anywhere. I, I feel like very much when you go and talk to, and, you know, I've gone and talked to, Oath key I like oath keepers. I enjoy their company. I like I, I've gone and talked to plenty of them. I've gone and talked to plenty of uh, you know, Black Lives Matter activists. It, it's like e everyone on both sides of this question. And they are not living in the same country anymore. They are living, they have very, very profoundly different ideas of what constitutes freedom, of what constitutes America, about what, what constitutes basic what the what the function of government is. And you know, and, and also those those areas are very geographically divided. So, you know, yes, America has always existed in tension, but it's never been as as totally riven as it is now. And it's also, you know, the also there are 400 million guns in America. So right now. So it's also never had as much potential for violence as it has now. S something I'm interested in here is. I want to get at something that comes through your writing that isn't quite coming through in this episode is you have a really interesting point about the position of the two parties right now. So number yeah. one would be your point that, and I thought this was such a, this is actually, I've, I've stolen this line. I used this line on a podcast we went on yesterday. So I gave you full credit, of course, where you said, thank goodness, or else I was about to get my lawyer involved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <go> um, <laughs> Republicans I'm basically paraphrasing you. Republicans understand that these institutions that they inhabit have collapsed. So Marjorie yeah. Taylor Greene understands that literally no one cares that she isn't on any committees right now. Um, that yes. that was supposed to be the punishment. Like it, so not only does she not care for her political objectives, it literally doesn't matter. Madison Cawthorn, he understands that I think he's doing a terrible job communications wise, but he understands he doesn't need to hire policy staffers to accomplish his goal, which is fame and power and influence over the right in America. But by contrast, you describe Democrats as not understanding the world of their childhood just no longer exists, and too many of their efforts yeah. are these futile attempts to make the world look like the way it used to be. Can you can you focus 
on, I think I did a good job explaining the Republican side, explain how yeah. that's manifesting. How is Pete Buttigieg, for example, how is Pete Buttigieg or Obama? They think these, they're very specific two type of people there. How are they trying to reconstitute an America that no longer exists? Well, they have this real faith and, you know, it's very hard to shake this faith that you've been raised in that American institutions are the solution to history, that they're exceptional beyond even their, their own country and that there's some kind of necessary, that they're, that they're a necessary nation and that that necessary nation is based on institutions. Um, what I think becomes very obvious when you look at the facts is that, you know, for example, by 2040, uh, 30% of the population will control 68% of the Senate. The Electoral College is, all, you know, it's inevitably going to produce um, a result where a Republican president wins the wins the presidency, uh, well, well, where six, seven million votes, uh, uh, it, he loses the popular vote by that much. And then you have, a, so the right has never really, like the right and, and these anti-government patriot movements, they've never really believed in the legitimacy of the state. And they, they and they actually think resistance to the state is good in itself. What's happening, I think, now very slowly is that the left is starting to catch up that actually these institutions are not legitimate. The Supreme Court, five out of the nine justices were selected by presidents who did not win the popular vote. So when when that abortion decision comes down, half the country inevitably, like who, whatever decision they make, will feel like they're not legitimately represented by their institutions. And so that that's what's dangerous, right? It's the structure of these things rotting away that is extremely dangerous because when they go, they're gone and getting them back is very hard. And the answer that tends to fall into place is violence. And I see no reason why it wouldn't be in violence. Um, so you know, but quick, as for the Pete yeah, Buttigieg please. of the world, like they just, um, you know, they just are clinging to an antique faith, right? They're clinging to like, it'll all work out. And, you know, the, the one thing I really uh, and want to be clear about in this book is that it's not going to work out on its own. You know, like it's not just we're not just going to stumble along into better times. It's not like we're going to it's not going to be like the 19. I don't know, I guess, like like 1877, where we're going to come to this commitment and then it's going to we're going to come to this agreement and then life will go on. It's it, it, it will not work that way. And something I'm wondering about here is because once again, like decent percent of the audience some some people in the audience are going to be open to the civil war discourse others won't for for different reasons there'll be interesting ideological yeah. breakdown there versus we, we we are proud to say this is actually bipartisan but what if it's that what if obviously like civil war as a title as a topic is like but what if it's really that america is becoming more like a country like france like let's say it's where you know like in france there's the first republic there's the second republic there's a monarchist like you know intervention there's the third fourth and fifth and during those periods there's a lot of there's there's a lot there's a lot of violence and there's like but but never once during those periods does that actually constitute a broad civil war beyond just like specific examples, maybe like the Paris Commune, like let's say, um, I think that's the third Republic. So I, I guess what I'm trying to basically get at here is how does America reconstitute itself? Because I, I, was, I was looking through the notes here and you actually, the first line of your book is that America is coming to an end. Um, mm. When my takeaway here is it's not that America is coming to an end. It's just that a certain version of America is coming to an end, just in the same way that the America um, of 1865 was different than the America of 1860, just as the um, America before the New Deal was different than the America after the New Deal. Could it really be that what we're labeling possibly as the end of America is just the beginning of a new America? Like, what do you think about that framework? Oh, of course. I mean, of course, it's a new. Uh, there will be a new America. I mean, but you know. For like the 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 example, France is actually. I mean, you know, the thing about France is that every single child, when they sit down in the whole country, uh, when they sit down for school, are taught the same things at the same hour. And the centralization of power in France, in Paris, is total in a way that you know no other country uh, works that way. And every every system emerges in this incredibly unifying force in the whole country. America is the opposite, and that's the beauty of America. I mean, let's just be frank about it. I mean, the beauty of America is that it's so much difference and you can and you and it, and it has so many local variants and it encompasses so much diversity of opinion, of race, of religion, of, uh, of businesses, of, of ideologies. I mean, it's just so incredibly productive that way. Um, so, you know, 
when France goes through these regime changes, like those are French, right? Like they are like, what, like there's a battle for the soul of France, but then the soul of France is redefined and it extends to everyone else. That's not really possible in America because America is just too big and too, you know, it's built on this acceptance of difference that's so powerful and, and so, and so wonderful, really. Um, so, you know, I don't think a French model is very good, but, you know, a way, a one way to think about it is there's the Roman Republic and then there's the Roman Empire, right? And that fall happens very suddenly. And there is a, there is Rome, but the, the Rome that ended uh, with Julius Caesar, you know, is not the same as the Rome after. And, you know, you're quite right. The, the question is, what kind of America will survive? And it's a very hard problem to answer. I mean, I do give some answers in this book, but, you know, in the book, I'm also trying to be, I, I try to be really precise. I want to do only things that I know and the models that I really believe in, right? Like the models that I see working and models that I have predictive capacities. So I don't really, I don't really uh, go into what, that future might look like like what a few what the what a, what a post break america would look like i mean i think being smaller more reasonable countries that can achieve political ends um w- would be a very reasonable solution like uh, you know at, at this point much of the south feels totally oppressed by washington and at the same time if you go to massachusetts and they they want reasonable gun laws but they can't get them um, this this is, seems to me like when marriages reach this point, when marriages reach the point that America's reached, you say you sit the kids down and you say it's time to break up. It's a hard fact, but it but it's but it's but it's, but it's that's the right thing to do. And so, yeah, I, I don't know what the next America will look like. It's, it, it's very confusing to say, because, you know, on the one hand, you have Trump supporters who really have a, a kind of institutional advantage in the political sphere. But then Biden voting counties are 70 percent of GDP, 60 percent of college educated uh, Americans voted for Biden. So they seem to have a kind of uh, like they're the productive and educated p- part of the country. So, it, you know, it, it, it's really it's really hard to know which America will survive or maybe they'll both survive in, in different riven forms. Well, two things here. One this is where I think it's important to focus on. I actually really appreciate your point about France and how the issue at question in France has never been, do we have a centralized government? Exactly. The question, so, so that's, have, that's actually- Are we a people? Are we a people is not a question French people ever ask themselves. They know we're the French, you know, and with Americans, that's the whole point. I mean, when my ancestors went to Ellis Island before they came North, like the whole idea was, I'm just going to be myself. You know, I'm not going to be like, I'm not going to be Italian anymore. Right. And, and so, and that's the great gift of America. So yeah, that, that just to say, that's my, so the, Fr- yeah. the French have a national idea of themselves that's extremely strong. And I think the American idea of itself has, is really fraying and, and dissolving. And when that, when that idea of yourself dies, I mean, you, you countries cannot live except by their dreams. What seems to me though, that I'm um, trying to pull some, strands of hope here. It seems that you've actually kind of given the settlement already. For example, when you're talking about, well, Massachusetts has one vision of the way gun laws should look, and Florida has a different one. It seems like you're just describing the benefits of federalism. So it seems, so for example, let's think about this through the lens of COVID. Like yeah. obviously Biden had the national mandate, but like as AOC is um, learning, um, Florida has very different laws um, than New York does when it comes to COVID. So it seems that for example, when you're referencing the possibility of Roe v. Wade getting overturned, it seems like the reason the reason why, frankly, don't believe there will be any sort of national divorce is that A, the benefits, which I think are very capable of being undercounted, like once again, um, you know, if you're a, if you're if you're Arkansas, um, trust me, you're not going to have a good time in a nationally divorced United States. Um, most southern no, states true. are not te- uh, most southern states are not Texas, so they do not have, you know, they don't have the capacity um, at self reliance that others do. But then, but then two is it just seems to me that the America we're going to see is going to be one which is much more decentralized in the sense that you're describing. It's going to be in America where, yeah, like it's it's very possible that um, in Texas there won't be affirmative action. In California, there will be affirmative action. In yeah. DC, there will be 
frankly, like ridiculous COVID policies in New York, there'll be more reasonable COVID policies. So I, I, I guess that's what I'm pushing you on is basically how do you look? I, 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 it seems like your, your, your case relies on being very skeptical of, and this is where I'm being clear here. Federalism mm-hmm. in the past was pure, was, federalism in the past was 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 used for like racial purposes. I think like that's yeah. like the, the the 20th century to me, and I think Saga will agree with this. Is like federalism and like states' rights were just like unabashedly like really used to really bad ends with like race and civil rights. It was all about the federal government rightfully cracking down. But in the 21st century, I'm like, I feel like we have a useful mechanism. So like, what do you think about that then? Well, that's absolutely a possibility. I mean, I, I think. You know, and, and that's also discussed in the book quite widely, like um, like decentralization and defederalization. I mean, you know, in my country, which almost split up twice, right, in my lifetime, like <laughs> once in 1982. And like, you know, I'm not like Canada. It's very strange for a Canadian to see American facing this because you were the bedrock for so long. And we were the ones who were almost, you know, it, it came within one percentage point of dissolving my country when I was 20. Right. So, uh, you know, what we did was radically defederalize de- things. Right. Like, like essentially Quebec can do whatever it wants. Yeah. Could you explain the history here real quick? We've never talked about Canada oh, on the show before. <laughs> of Canada. Well, there's Quebec separatism. They want to set, they, you know, that's, there's actually not a huge amount of political difference between Quebec and the rest of Canada. We agree widely on healthcare, education, the role of government, um, but they're their own people. Right. And they're their own. They have their own identity and they have their own language and they're trying to preserve their own language. And one prominent way they want to do they thought of doing that is by separating and becoming their own country. Um, Also, there's a long history of the oppression of French Canadians by English Canadians, which is absolutely true. Um, And so uh, but it, it didn't happen. And we then we we signed a new constitution in 1982 which means that we have a constitution that actually makes sense in the contemporary life, which I do not think is any longer true of your constitution. It is a work of great genius, but it is a work of great genius from a different century. And that is becoming clearer and clearer every day. But you know, this point you bring up about interest, like people's interest in, there's no interest in separating, like there's no, it's not financially viable. Like that's absolutely true, but it really makes no difference in other separatist movements that that's almost always true there too, right? I mean, there are three times as many countries today as there were in 1945. And when those countries separated, it wasn't for self-interest, it was for passion. It was for identity. It was for a sense of self. And, you know, I think when you talk to separatists in like, you know, there's an extensive interview interview, uh, Daniel Miller, the, Texas nationalist movement leader in in Texas, uh, and when you bring up these questions with him, I mean these these he I mean he has answers of various kinds, but his basic argument he's very frank about it is like I'm a Texan, that's my identity, that's who I am, and to be it, if it's a choice between being a Texan and being in an in a large scale entity called the United States of America, I'm going to pick being a Texan, and the, the que- so the question of secession is really like self-interest doesn't really factor into it all that much. Like it's it's more about our separate identities forming in the United States. And I would argue pretty strongly that they are, that these, that these political differences that we see between these two parties are in fact, you know, really emissaries of, of, of social differences and identity differences that are increasingly profound and which, and, and which are increasingly irreconcilable. So, you know, I would love to think that people acting rationally would would not want to separate. You know, when America, if America breaks up, all of the countries that would form would be nowhere near as powerful as the United States of America. They would have nowhere near the the, the global sweep or the, the influence of America. But on the other hand, they might be more rational and they might be more themselves. You know, they might be they might be able to achieve what they consider to be appropriate political ends more with more with more power with more with more efficacy with more efficiency and so you know that that question of of interest and so on is um it it matters less than you think i think the biggest problem i think i see with this thesis is that it's still relying on geography 
when mm. we're not really divided by geography. We're divided by class. Plumbers in Alabama have a lot more in common with plumbers in California, and educated college elites in Massachusetts have the same thing in common with educated elites in Austin. I mean, what we yeah. really see, the most predictive thing in the United States today for who you voted for or not is did you have a four-year college degree? Geography yeah. managers somewhat, but the educated suburbs of Atlanta have a lot in common with the educated suburbs of Omaha and the educated suburbs of uh, of Houston. All three actually ended up going for Biden at a much more disproportionate rate yeah. than within their states. So doesn't that throw a whole wrench? I mean, the people yeah, who are it's, alive it's actually even worse. don't yeah. live in the, the same people, place. Yeah. Well, it's even actually worse because the, the actual biggest marker is density. Right. Like the, like it, like the density of neighborhoods is like the number one marker of Republican Democrat. So like sure, yeah. you if you go to New York State and you're in a rural area, I mean, it can it, it's not particularly distinct from, say, Oklahoma, you know, like it's in, in terms of its politics, in terms of, of in terms of the Trumpism. Um, that is a big question. Now, I mean, it's such a complicated argument from the book, but it, it has to do with the, the big sort and how people are sorting out. Now, the geographical boundaries are increasing, like the, the divisions, the political divisions, like increasingly there are one state states. Like if you look at presidential elections or Senate elections from 50 years ago, there was a lot more variety and variation. And one of the reasons is the, the simple disappearance of independence. Right. Like in a, in a, a lot of people identify as independents, when you actually go into the data, like only about four to six percent of people actually change their voting behavior between elections. So with the with the with the you know, it's all of a piece. Right. It's a complicated, complex cascading system. So you're you're absolutely right that there are these huge geographical problems. On the other hand, there's another force that's coming into play where you know like this the democratic there has not been a republican in in, in any um office in san francisco since 1964 right like it's Cal, california has runoffs between democratic senators for its senatorship like it's it, and texas has not had a democratic state what i think what was i forget the year i think it was 1992 yeah right when was that that was oh, sorry ann richards ann richards was the governor yeah it was 92 right. i mean i was alive in 92, 92. so i don't know right <laughs> yeah but 95 was when quebec nearly separated right like you know like i like it, there, there, there's a lot of water under the bridge since 1992 um so you know these these places are becoming more single party states and you know the other thing that happens is that when that happens the political discourse of course goes crazy inherently Right. Like if you only have Democrats talking to each other, then they start to do what they do in San Francisco, which is like, let's obsess over renaming the schools. And and, and you, have, you have these crazy policies that because there's no there's no counterblast to it. And the same thing, of course, in Texas, where separatist movement are growing because like it's an inner Republican uh, struggle. So it, it feeds on itself, th this separation, it feeds on itself. And, it, and it, it does have geographical components, although what you say about density is absolutely true and a hugely complicating factor. And here's, you know, there's been a lot of disagreement on this podcast. I would say something you've convinced me of is the real relevance of separatist national movements in other countries, especially in the 21st century. So an idea I want, I want to discuss a little bit about is you're, you're discussing yeah. Quebec. We, you know, can obviously make a reference to Scotland in the United Kingdom. Yeah. Um, let's put Catalonia. the Basques to the side. Let's focus yeah, on sure. Catalan um, in Spain. Yeah. That one's, <laughs> Basques are just like, we're just going to put that to the side. Let's focus on Catalan. Yeah. Um, let's focus on, you know, uh, Iraq, right? Like, does it make sense that there to be a Sunni yeah. state, a Shia state? Should there be Kurds, et cetera? It's like, yeah, Kurds, that's a whole other. <laughs> let's put really ethnic groups really to the side there as the TLDR yeah. there. They I don't like to be put to the side, man. They yeah, want, no, but I'm, I'm proving, like I'm proving, I'm proving, I'm proving their argument. They want to be their own countries. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's true. It's true. Um, no offense, Basques and Kurds, but no. Wait, let's let's talk about this though. What keeps? Because look, the historical force that matters here, and you have brought to the fore here, is in the twenty first century, institutions have less and less power. America may be the most extreme version of this, but 
for yeah. example, like, like why, why is it that the UK could hypothetically split apart? Like the, the monarchy is, is, is weaker. National institutions are weaker. Insert Brexit statement, yep. body, body. So this is a global phenomenon. God knows it's true what, here. It's true in Canada for sure. Yeah. So then what, yeah. what, what, what keeps countries together? So how does, so let me put it this way. If the trend is towards decentralization for a variety yeah. of reasons, what actually successfully keeps countries together? Um, not to the extreme of Iraq, which is like a colonial imposition, but I guess that's within it too. Like how, what keeps these, what, what keeps legacy countries together when the factors or forces that united them for brief shining moments in the 1800s or 1900s are gone? That's my question. Well, I mean, God, that's a really good question. I've not thought about that. What actually keeps countries together? I've been thinking so much about what blows countries apart. I mean, I, I, I honestly think that most countries have a kind of national solidarity, and that solidarity is based on myths, lies. You lie. It's like families. What keeps families together? What keeps families together is, is the myths you tell yourself about your own family, right? And and also self interest. Like also, you're, you're in a mutual collection of self-interest and also a sense of promise and a sense of growth. Um, and, you know, as those things evaporate, that's when things start to fall apart. Um, you know, I would say that countries falling apart is rare, right? Like it's not, it's not something that happens all the time. And it, th like the reason they, they have very specific conditions have to be in place for it to happen. Now, you know, when I talk to the the experts on separatism and the experts on uh, countries seceding, like and these civil war experts and so on, they I mean, they were very frank with me. They're like, America will end. Right. Like all countries end. There's no like no no country survives forever. Um, but how to answer that question? I mean, I I guess it's easier well, for no, me your to myth, see your, as a your, negative. Your, your, your... Your myth, no, I, this is actually important. Your, your, yeah, national, because myth is a bit of a, I, you weren't using it pejoratively, but like, let's just use the but like I mean, national, I, I, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say myth slash national story. It seems to me yeah, that part exactly. of, it seems that, and this is, and this is still important. Like, I really, I really like the UK. The, the national story of the United Kingdom is still it's stronger intense. than, 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 Absolutely. than Scottish nationalism. Um, yes, deserve, des, deserve, deservedly so, in my opinion. Like the, the the story there is still stronger. So it seems to me then. Okay, here's a good question. The, the 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 if you think of these, I really like this myths and stories idea. If you think of the um, 1860s, the the yeah. myths that the South had are actually yes. stronger than the national story. So I guess I guess the real question here is what 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 are the two stories? That both sides, I don't know, I don't want to say both because this isn't a left right thing necessarily. What, what, what is the story of American unity right now from your perception as a Canadian? And what is the story from a myth and story perspective of American disunion? Well, I mean, I tried to deal with it in the books through reporting and researching the silent sand controversy at UNC. That just seemed to me like a good example where you had this, this myth in Reconstruction, silent Sam. Uh, you know, the Confederacy, Confederate soldiers and Union soldiers meeting. And of course, what the first thing they agree on, the first thing they can come to an agreement on is white supremacy, right? So this is a reconstituted myth, which is a lie, but is a basis for that, for, for reunion of these two, of these two sides. Um, and exploring that and like the tearing down of the sculpture the attempt to like, what are they, how are they supposed to rebuild it? They're, it's impossible. The, the, the board of trustees at the UNC have no, no options really. They have no, they have so no this was options. A statue, not, to be clear, this, this, this was, was like a statue. A sta yeah. Yeah. But you know, like I, I, the question of how the American story has rotted, I mean, that's a pretty profound question. And um, I'm not sure I have a hundred percent of an answer to that, except to say that I can see it happening and that people you know, when you go to, I, I mean, I think like if I were to, if I were to, this is me, I, you know, the book is so, I, I worked so hard in the book to just do the facts that I believed in. So I tried to limit my opining as much as possible mm -hmm. and stay as close to what I, to accuracy as I could. But, you know, I think 2008 was huge. I think, you know, when you, when every, everyone I met here from the Oath Keepers and so on, they, that's when all of that started. It all started in 2008. I think it was a combination of 
the, the housing crisis, which essentially made the middle class in America almost impo- out of reach for tens of millions of people and shattered the American dream. Right. Um, and w- where you're also starting to see everyone younger is going to be poorer than their parents. Well, that's the whole Amer- the whole idea of America is the opposite. Of that, right. And then you also have the failure of the surge in Iraq um, where, you know, American power abroad, America as this delivering angel that's going to bring democracy to the world, you know, crumbles and falls apart. And then you have Obama, the election of Obama and, you know, this new multicultural iconography that is just simply intolerable to a significant subset of white Americans. I, to me, if you're asking me where where did the story start to wither, it, it would be that. It would be that that would be the year. Because it because it was because it was the, the basic premise of the country, our our force is for good. Uh, we our economy lifts all boats. Um, these things and, and who and who we are. These things all start to erode at the same time, and then, and then, you know, it, you can really directly trace the rise of like sovereign citizenship and the, the militia movements to that moment, very, very clearly. So, you know, if if we're talking about the death of the American story, it would be that. But as I said, yeah, you know, there's a lots of different ways to look through that. I mean, a lot. I'm sure both of you have probably better ideas. Yeah. Immediately, immediately, I'm like, well, you know, the depression was pretty bad too. Uh, there yeah. were a lot of communists. There were literal Nazis. Uh, banker and mortgage people were literally getting like shot in the streets in Ohio. It took like four or five years for democracy to work uh, before it actually came about. I just, I see a consistent underplaying of the role of the democratic process and patience, like. Trump has only, it's only been here for five years. That's actually just not that long of a time. Um, like there, there hasn't even been a real chance, in my opinion, for the process to even absolve or understand what exactly even happened in 2016. I know that's really frustrating, like for the people who are living through these times, but I look back at history and see decades of turmoil, which eventually get reconciled, in which everybody's kind of pissed off, but not pissed off enough to scream about it anymore. So but, I guess you know, I would just the wanna... examples you keep bringing up, you're like, yeah. oh, it's just like the 30s. I'm like, the 30s didn't end well. You know, the 30s ended with a blood, a global bloodbath. Yeah, but not civilly. Ethnic... I'm saying, if anything, we came together. Well, yeah, so but that's like, that's yeah. why it didn't end civilly, right? Like that, it, oh. it it got exported elsewhere. Right. Similarly, like, you know, to say that we're in a new 30s is not a comforting proposition to me. Like, I mean, like, you know, also, I really think Trump is a distraction. I mean, I, I really do. Like I, I think you talk, oh, this, this is good. Talk. Could, yeah. What do you this, mean by this, that? This, this happened in the book. Um, could you explain? Yeah. I, I, I noted this. Explain, and you could start with Trump, but Obama, Trump, and Biden. What are their like roles like within this? Well, I don't. I mean, I I don't really know. See, the thing is, when this as the system begins to collapse, like as the as the government is no longer capable of making effective policies i I mean you know like the build back better bill like which is this big deal right now like in every other mature democracy that's wednesday that's a budget like that's not that's not a that's not a difficult thing to do it's just if you have power you do it and that's your policy and if you don't like the policy you kick the bums out and you get some new guys in to make some new policies uh you know i i noticed this in 2015 when i first started going to trump rallies and started going to bernie sanders rallies too where you know, I would leave Canada. This is what a Canadian election debate sounds like. Sir, we need to spend $28.9 million on early childhood education. Sir, you're completely wrong. We need to spend $27.6 million on childhood education. It's completely boring. It's all about numbers. Nobody basically listens. You come to America and it's God and socialism and these vast categories of ideas that really have nothing to do with what the government can actually do. And the reason for that is that these politicians know that when they get into power, it's gonna, what they can actually do is very, very, very circumscribed. And, you know, so for me, when when you see Obama, Trump, Biden, like what you're seeing is people losing control of the capacity to make policy in a consistent way. And it, it, it doesn't really matter which of them is in power. 
It like because the, it's the system underneath it that's no longer capable of delivering anything to its to its followers. And then that, of course, that disappointment and leads to despair, and despair leads to rage. You know, I th- I think that's that's the core process. Getting, this, getting, the, the, star, getting Paul, the Star Wars references. <laughs> Is there one? I, 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 I've been so ingrained I, I, in my head that I make a yeah, Star you, Wars you, 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 just, you just quoted Star Wars, <laughs> the path to the dark side. Did I? But sorry, go on. Oh, the dark side. Sorry. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, is that even a reference at this point in our lives? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like it's, um, yeah. So like it's, it's this, it's this, this process where, you know, you can become obsessed with like, I mean, I, I say very early in the book that, and it, it is the hardest fact to explain to explain to liberal interviewers is that if Hillary Clinton had been elected in 2016, everything in this book would still be true. Right. Like every, the, the process is underway have nothing to do with whether Marjorie Taylor green is on Twitter or whatever, or whatever horse race politics mm-hmm. uh, question is obsessing people over the moment. The trends are, are much deeper. Yeah. So here's my um, last question here that brings it back to the national story bit here because mm. the difficult point i have for liberals is it's like we i think agreed on like national stories are deeply important and we're at this really weird we're not, I, I don't want to say weird because i understand like i understand why blm activists are tearing down statues i yep, intellectually like i i i understand yep. why if you're like a super progressive in san francisco like why you want to rename a school like i don't agree with it i think it's kind of productive but i get it but what seems to frustrate, but what frustrates me, what I don't think liberals understand, and this fits into your like Democrats don't understand the way the world is changing. Point is, if you tear down myths and stories, but your society and institutions are incapable of telling new stories, that leads to disaster. Like that's the contradiction. So like, but what frustrates me is the people in New York City who took down Thomas Jefferson um, from the city council meeting office. I totally oppose that decision. But the big problem is. Okay, you told you tore down TJ, but you and the society we live in are actually not capable of coming to a consensus around new figures, new stories. And when you do exactly. that, you actually further the destruction of the institutions that you actually own. So we're in this weird self-owning moment. Absolutely. And they and and and, exactly. and, 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 and it's like fascinating that they don't why 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 don't why does why do liberals not understand? I guess that's my question. Like, why do liberals not understand this dynamic? That's an but I think but it's like the same, directionally. It's the same process. You understand? It's the same process as happens on the right. Like they get into a dis, they get into despair over the p- capacity for government to enact what they want politically, and so they respond aesthetically and they respond to trying to change the narrative and by by violence, right? And it's equally as, of course, it's it, it doesn't do anything. And I mean, you know. Perhaps it's too much to ask for a political entity to be, to have nuance, but like, surely, like if, when you're in a family or in any entity that requires myth building, you know, you have to understand that there's good and bad and that that's part of you and that's part of your entity. And that's part of the world because the world is very complex and no, and and like Thomas Jefferson, you know, obviously a very, complex figure containing huge amounts of contradictions in him but america always was a country of contradictions and that that to me that's its fundamental beauty right is that it was so capable of holding contradictions in 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 mind and from that ability everything came you know like like all these ideas sprouted all all these all these innovations all this all, all this um all this peace and prosperity too emerged from that capacity to hold on to contradictions. And, you know, if you can't hold on to contradictions, then you get into absolutes. And when you get into absolutes, you tear down sculptures or you storm the Capitol building and, and smear, smear feces on the wall. Like that, that, that's the, I mean, that's really kind of the nub of it. You know what I mean? Like, mm. and, 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 and the, the real question is, well, what is the new myth? What is the new myth of America? What is the big story of America? And I, I don't know, I'm Canadian. You know, I got my own myths over here that are falling apart that I'm trying to replicate, that I'm trying to recreate. I, I'm not sure what the next story for America will be. Um, I, I'll, 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 I'll close. I'll close the interview with this, which is that you know, as we're 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 getting to the story of the 1930s and the 1860s, the key thing here is the answer is political talent and ability. Um, 
FDR tells a new yes, story of true. America with the New Deal. Lincoln refounds well, last act he did, obviously, but works through the process of like refounding America at the same time that he's waging the Civil War. He's expanding land grant colleges and passing the Homestead Act, so people could once again. I'm really not trying to disparage Native Americans here, but like a key part of that story, how America came together after the Civil War was we expanded westward. We continued yep. and you went out to California, Oklahoma, Arizona, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it seems to me what we're missing right now and why people feel rightfully like we're on a path to despair that wasn't viable in 1932 is we don't seem to have the political talent that's capable of 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 telling of telling a new story that builds from what you've had before but also offer something new. So I think that's the task well, for people here. Let me ask you a question. Like, cause I would say that Obama was that right. Like he, he had a vision of America. Sager Bay. Right? Here we go. <laughs> yeah. You know, like he, he had, had a vision he had a, and he, he had a vision and, and it, and the reaction was you're a Kenyan. And, mm. and then, you know, also it's not, it, it, the, re, the reaction to it is Trump. So, I mean, I'm not sure I've like, I don't, I certainly can't, don't think I, it's fair to hope for a greater political talent than Barack Obama again in our lifetimes. Oh, I absolutely think we we could have, I mean, he might be a good speaker, but he was actually a terrible leader of the Democratic Party, inability to have any real check of cultural leftism, which he knew was a problem so much so that he went out of his way to downplay it. I mean, in terms of his actual finette. No, no, he didn't. Well, like, but, but, not real really. quick thing, Stephen. This is actually, and you said yeah. this in your book. The the, the answer here, and, and you say this explicitly, um, is Obama's national story was there is no red America, there is no blue America, yeah. as and you it, said, it was, and it that was true. not true. Yeah. So that's so, so that's it's so that's true. the point. Like Sagar's making a really important point. But myths point are not that, true, yeah. right? Well, no, but no, but no, but I mean, no, like, here's the thing. But they're op- but it wasn't operationable. So so fair. Like it, the, it, my, yeah. our critique isn't that's that like enough. well Obama technically speak. That, that's not the critique. The critique <laughs> is it wasn't actually usable as a. I think that because like just because I want people to highlight this when Sager says Obama was a terrible politician, but he's literally referring to the fact that like during his stewardship of the Democratic Party, the DNC fell apart. Um, local yeah. state they lost a like, thousand like, state house yeah. seats, the U.S. Senate, and the House of Representatives. Representatives. That's so a that's, political failure. But I think that has right. nothing to do with any action that he could have done. I mean, that, that's from my. Right. So he's a tragic. So he's a tragic. Right. So, so here's the thing. But here's the thing. Yeah. He is a tragic. I, I actually, for sure. So, 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 yeah, I agree. So, Steve, I agree with you. I think he was a failure, and there's probably. I don't think there's anything he could have done. But sometimes, yeah. I'm sure we could name some British prime minister from 1832 who was effing brilliant, but we don't remember because he wasn't meeting the times that Gladstone and Israeli were meeting. I, I right, think that's, sure. I think, I think that's, I think sometimes yeah. power and politics the are tragic make, and yeah. Yep. So I think that's yeah, a good place to leave it. Um, uh, Stephen, um, this is coming out the day of um, book launch, obviously. Um, the book is the uh, next civil war dispatches from the American future. We really appreciate you stopping by the realignment. Thanks. Pleasure to talk to you guys. Ciao. Really appreciate it. Mm-hmm.